wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the servant, Because you have done this, all will not be well. Amen. Amen. It's a great joy and delight this morning. Uh, to welcome our guest speaker, Kephas Amos. He is a pastor, a fellow colleague in Christ. Uh, and we have been in fellowship with his church for 55 years. His church is the Church of Christ in Nations. And we've been in fellowship with them uh, primarily through Jennifer Sweatman. And Kephas and his lovely wife, Rita, is with, Rit is with us uh, this morning. And they've come to minister to us. It's so good that you can come amongst us. Actor Kephas is here, being sent by his church, not his church, his whole denomination, to come to the UK and help us in the UK in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and in discipleship. So we thank God for you, brother. We thank you for what you're doing in this country. Thank you for helping us. We need it. Bless you, and we look forward to hearing the word. Amen. Thank you. I want to thank God for the privilege of being here and um, to stand among you and bring to you the gratitude of the Church of Christ in Nations for the work you did in sending one of you, praying for that person, supporting her in the years of service she rendered to the Lord and to the body of Christ in general in Nigeria, Church of Christ in Nations. I am a direct beneficiary of your investment because I was a student and I remain a student of Jenny Sweatman. I had the privilege of going to Gindry where she served for several years. And so, hey, here, have a test of what the Lord used her to do while in Nigeria. Um, if I make mistakes, hold her responsible, because it means. <laughs> 
But it's been a privilege, and thank you, um, Pastor Duncan, for the uh, step of faith in inviting me to come and preach. Today, I saw him for the first time, and it's always a risk to invite someone you've never heard, you've never met, um, on the word of another. But um, I just pray that the Lord himself will be honored even as we um, fellowship together. And so uh, my standing here is to say you, uh, you give to the Lord when you send someone to minister in Cochin, have a test of the fruit of your sons. Uh, it's a joy to have my brother Yakubu Choji with us. He's one of the members that worship with us in, the, in, in London, uh, in what the Lord has started. So I, I ask that, um, I, I hope that this will not be the last time we will have the privilege of fellowshipping together. Thank you. Shall we pray together? We come before your throne of grace, O Lord, in the acknowledgement that your word is above all. And we open our hearts that you will speak to us the word of life. That you will enlighten the darkness of our hearts. And you will reveal Jesus to us, even as we worship. And draw us to a closer walk with you. We ask this in your name. Amen. I love to read Genesis chapters 1 and 2. How I wish the whole of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, would go like the story we read in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. The wonderful work of creation. This perfect God. This powerful God who would declare and it will come to be. And this orderly God who would create and everything would be in its place and functioning as it ought to be. So we read how God created the whole world. We read how the animals were behaving in order. The vegetation produced as it ought to be. We read of the first union between man uh, that, that God initiated between man and the woman, and that union was perfect. Everything went on very well. We also read in, in, in chapter 3, we see we have a test of the union between God and man, and this woman he has brought with him. In. Why? Because the Bible says in the cool of the evening, God will come and have fellowship. I mean, it paints a, a picture of such a beautiful world. Actually, if you ask me, that's the kind of world I would wish I was living in. That's the kind of world I would love for all of us to continue to live in. And we read in verse 25, this powerful testimony to the perfect world. Because it says, the man and his wife were naked. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They felt no shame. Everything was right. Relationship perfect. Their relationship with one another perfect. Their relationship with God Perfect. They felt no shame because every thought and inclination of their hearts were pure. There was no shame because every instruction of God was fully obeyed. And where there is perfect obedience, God is glorified and honored. They felt no shame because man existed in the perfect plan of God. You remember what God said to them when he created them? Be fruitful and multiply. Rule over the birds of the air. Take care of the earth that I've given you. In chapter 2, verse 15, we read of how God took man and placed him in the garden and gave him work to do, responsible work. And man was happy doing that work. And as long as he obeyed God, he didn't eat of the tree of that, that he was told not to eat, everything went well. 
What it means is the word of God was law. The word of God was the delight of the man and his wife. The word of God was the guide and instruction for life. And as such, everything went very well. The earth therefore gave of its best because the word of God, the perfect word of God, ruled. I imagine that lions lost their ferocity because there was no need for them to be destructive. The word of God that brings peace reigned. The cobra, the adder, the most poisonous of snakes were friendly animals and beings. Every creature that had a capacity to cause destruction couldn't do that, didn't have a need to do that because there was no concept of evil in their hearts. And man and his wife had no need to be ashamed. They were open, truly open, not hypocritical in any way. And no shame. And God had wonderful fellowship. Oh, how I wish that we live in a time when we can truly be open. When the secrets of our hearts would be visible even as a projection on the screen to our spouses and our friends. I love my wife dearly, but I'll tell you, it's not every thought that passes through my heart that I would want her to see because of the fall that has come to man. And we have friends and people we relate with, people we actually enjoy fellowship with, and yet, at times, the thoughts that pass through our hearts. Oh, we can't afford to be naked in those instances because we would have things we would want to hide. In chapter 3, this word of God that sustained relationship, that sustained the earth, that was the principle for life, was broken. And suddenly... Something happened. The eyes of Adam and Eve were opened. And they ran away from God. And they discovered they were naked. I said, what an irony. In chapter 2, we are told they were already naked. But they felt no shame. But in this same chapter 3, just a chapter after, Maybe a whole lifetime after. Because of disobedience to the law and instruction of God. They discovered their nakedness. Their eyes opened. Oh, how I wish that God will help us to remain blind to the lifestyle that will cause us to run away from the presence of God. How I wish that God will help us so that our eyes will never be open to the invitation to a lifestyle that will cause us to be rebels, that will cause us to realize that we are naked. And because they were naked, they had a need to cover themselves. And the Bible says that they covered themselves with fig leaves. Oh, how inadequate that must have been. Here was Adam and Eve that were covered in the covenant relationship of God. The, the, the covenant God had with them was their cover. The joy of the Lord was their cover. The presence of God over their lives was a sufficient cover. And now they wanted to make do with fig leaves. Why? Because disobedience had come in. You see, this strange emotion that existed in them was not created by God. Shame came into their lives, and God did not create shame. God did not intend that any of us would live under shame. He intended that we would live without shame. Why? Because where there is perfect union with God, there will be no shame. But sin brought about nakedness, and nakedness brought about shame, and shame brought the need for cover. Many times, 
If you look at Christians, most often you'll find that we are always looking for something to cover our shame. Meanwhile, if we had not fallen into sin, we would not have had a need for cover because the covenant of God would always be sufficient cover for us. He who is surrendered to the Lord, he who is yielded to the Lord, he who is dead to, to the flesh and lives only in Christ, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, for I have been, uh, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Therefore, the life I live in the flesh, I live by the power of him who died for me. So if it is Christ that lives and expresses himself in and through me, I would be nothing that will cause me shame. Why? Because those who meet me would have met Christ. Those who hear me would hear Christ. Those those I touch would be touched by Christ. And wherever Christ is exalted and glorified, shame never has a place to, to, of dwelling there. Therefore, in the first chapter we see that God's intention for us for all of eternity, the picture of the relationship God, God has for us is that we will be naked and not be ashamed. And in the coming of Christ, it is to restore us to that position where we will be naked and not be ashamed. Adam and Eve, therefore, were ashamed because they were guilty before God. They broke the covenant of God they broke the law and the instructions of God. They broke their relationship. They chose themselves rather than choosing to live for the Lord. And therefore, they became guilty. But they felt shame because their innocent state had been tainted. tainted. So when we break the law, when we do what is wrong, and we are guilty, we are acknowledging that, yes, in being guilty, I have done something wrong. But in being ashamed, we are acknowledging that I am wrong. There's something that has happened deep within me that fundamentally changes me, that is wrong within me. So shame goes beyond the fact that we have committed an offense. It reveals the fact that something has happened and I have changed. I have changed. That is why a person who breaks his covenant relationship in marriage, one who falls into an adulterous relationship, or one who disobeys in the office and steals. Beyond the fact that I am a thief. And even, I mean, in, in the case of a thief, you could be asked to refund or return what you have stolen. But even when you return what you have stolen, it does not change the fact that something has fundamentally gone wrong. And therefore moved me to stealing. That is the source of shame in our lives. So shame breaks our innocence. Shame destroys the innocent sent relationship and position we have that could open us up to God and bring us to God. We live in a world that many struggle with shame. So I ask, why are we ashamed? What is the cause of shame in your life? What is the cause of shame in my life? What have I broken? What have you broken? Have you broken a trust by God or trust by man? Is it a broken marriage promise? It is, is it that you've broken someone's heart? What is it? What, what, what is it that, 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 that has caused shame? And all these years, there's been a struggle to cover it. You know, the interesting thing is sometimes we feel shame not necessarily because what we have done, because of what we have done, 
but because of what has been done to us. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we are abused and dehumanized. Sometimes we find ourselves subjects of such physical abuse, sexual abuse, or verbal abuse that begins to define you and make you think, yeah, maybe I, 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 I'm not good enough. That is why this has happened to me again and again. And you begin to accept that as God's, as though it were God's perception of who you really are. And when you have suffered, when you suffer shame as a result of what has been done to you, you find that your life is always a swing. It could be that in high school as a young child, if, if as a young person growing you suffered shame, the mere mention of the name of the person who caused shame brings back the past. And it, it just messes up the joy of the present. It destroys and shakes the peace of the present. Sometimes it's as though when you have reached a point where you are growing in victory, you've, you've left the place where you suffered such shame and abuse and, and you are enjoying a new identity, new relationship, and you are developing in confidence. But the mere mention of a city or the name, a similar name of a person, it brings back past memories of things that you thought you had left behind. And so, sometimes we carry this shame with us. But the question really is, what do we do with shame? Since it is clear, this is not what God intended for us. God's plan for us was to live a victorious, joyful life. Where we, we existed in harmony with him. Where there was such harmony between creation and man and God. And, and we, we, we would be living in heaven. And in various ways we try to suppress our shame. Or ignore it. And therefore many... In an effort to suppress and ignore shame, we have perfected the art of hypocrisy. We have perfected pretense. But I tell you, that's not God's plan. That's not God's plan. So are you suffering? Are you going through shame? Is there, is there a shame that is being covered? And here are some things that for me constitute a symptom that when, when I notice them in my life, it means that there's a shame that I'm trying to cover. Sometimes people who are struggling with shame try to defend their shame. And we see an example of this in Genesis, the passage we read. Adam and Eve had done a despicable thing in breaking the law of God. And God came asking, Adam, where are you? And he was in hiding. And he said, Lord, I heard your voice. But because I'm naked and ashamed. Well, maybe he didn't mention shame there, but we know that's the underlying emotion there. Because I'm, I, I, I realized I am naked. I hid. And God said, who told you you are naked? Adam didn't accept his fault. He tried to defend himself. It's not my fault. It's the fault of this woman. If you hadn't brought her in my life, I would have remained the innocent person. Yet scripture says he was there at the point of temptation, listening to the discussion a participant in every transaction, and he ate. Do you find yourself seeking excuses for what you did instead of owning up and accepting, I have sinned, I have done what is wrong. Lord, have mercy on me. Or if you find that 
there's a tendency, oh, there's a habit, a developing and a growing habit to, to, to cover and defend yourself. Maybe it's a pointer to the fact that there's something shameful that is supposed to point you back to God so that you find deliverance. Others deal with it in trying to put a mask. We pretend that this thing does not exist. We pretend that this thing that, uh, that, that, has, that, that shames me has not happened to me. So we go out as though, oh, all is well. And you would find out in scripture, each time Jesus was going to meet people and heal and bring a miraculous intervention in their lives, he asked to know what they wanted so that they would own up to their situation. With blind Bartimaeus, he asked him, what do you want? And blind Bartimaeus acknowledged, I want my sight. With the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he led her to acknowledging the fact that, look, she wasn't where God wanted her to be so that she would own up to her failure and her defect so that she would find help. And when she did, she went back into the city and said, come and see a man who told me everything I had ever done. And she was released from the captivity of the sin. Many times, because we would rather cover our shame, some of us or some people engage in activities that would push away the pointer to the fact that I'm guilty of this. And for us preachers, it is so easy. When I speak about theft and I preach so strongly about stealing, the impression is then the pastor doesn't steal because, I mean, you wouldn't expect me to preach about stealing if I steal, would you? If I'm a liar, maybe I, I, would, I would speak so strongly about it. If I indulge in secret pornography, maybe I'll speak so strongly about it. I'm not saying that's the characteristic of all preachers. Don't get me wrong, but the truth is, many times, the very sins we are ashamed of are the things we find ourselves so anxious and eager to deny, to throw off the opinion of people about it, or the suspicion of people that we engage in it. Yet God's desire is that we would own up and take this shame and bring it to him, and he will break it. Some try to destroy their shame. And I find this very common in this generation, where people who have suffered such indignities and suffered shameful acts find ways of even ending their lives in suicide, in, in, in pains, in painful activities. Some cut themselves, some subject themselves to very terrible things, destructive behavior, self-destruction, so that they would perhaps escape from their shame. Some try to transfer their shame on others. And you find that the common tendency with bullies, you know, bullies are those who try to cover their insecurities by, by, by beating and harassing and embarrassing and subjecting others to terrible experiences. Some try to drown their shame in lifestyles that are unhealthy. Some resort to alcohol, some resort to drugs, some resort to pornography, some to various addictions, all, all in a bid to cover up their shame. And that's why I love what Pastor Duncan said in the service, that this is a church that is not ashamed of the fact that there are people struggling with addictions and are happily offering places of deliverance. And that's what God desires, that we will take our shame and come boldly to him because he is the deliverer. 
Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And you know the abundant life that Christ has for us, oh, it goes beyond shame. It covers every and any kind of shame we may have suffered. Here's the truth. You and I were not desired to carry shame. We were not desired, we were not created, sorry, to, to live in shame. And which is, this is the reason why it hurts. This is the reason why whenever we do something that causes shame, oh, there's, there's, there's unrest within us, there's a lack of peace, because that is not what God created you and I to be. His intention was not that we would live and experience shame in any way. This is why something in your being kicks against it. And yet, Satan keeps pushing it to us. He doesn't want us to realize who we are in Christ Jesus. Because when we give our shame over to the Lord Jesus, he heals us. Satan wants to plant seeds of bitterness. Satan wants to fill us with pride. Satan wants us to live in self-denial, in denial of what has happened to us so that we will not open up to the solution that God has for us. But we have a good father. Oh, here's the joyful part. We have a God who loves us. He loves us beyond our sin. He loves us because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us so much so that he sent his one and only son that he should come and pay the price for the sin, for the shame that we could not pay. Because his intention was not that we would live in shame. So he sent Jesus. Jesus came that we would be restored to the place of perfect and joyful life with Christ, that's with God, that's what he wants for us. Oh, he wants us to live in victory. God wants us to know who we are in him. And I tell you, it is Satan's lie when he makes us think we are not good enough. Oh, God didn't send Jesus to die because we deserved it. No, it's because he loves us so much. We didn't deserve it, yet he did it anyway. Because that's his nature. That's how much he loves us. Not because we had earned it, but because though we had not earned it, he loves us, his creation, his bearers of his image and likeness so much that he wouldn't allow us to perish. We have a good father who wants us to experience forgiveness. We have a good father who wants us to experience reconciliation. We have a good father who wants us to come to him because he's a merciful father. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, we have broken his commands. Yes, we have rebelled against him. But the love he has for us is so much that oh, he's given his one and only son so that he would die in our place. Listen to what Scripture says in Romans chapter 5, from verse 1 to 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And listen. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hey, listen, brethren, there is, a, there, there, there is a plan, there is a future that God has for us. God has something in store. There's a hope that we have that our shameful acts should not separate us from. And that is found in Christ. 
In Jesus, we find justification. In Jesus, we find forgiveness. In Jesus, we find the mercy of God. In Jesus, we find true love. True love that is not because of, but in spite of. True love that liberates us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, what a beautiful exchange. That God in Christ will take me, the sinner, and exchange my position, my deserving of his rejection and punishment, and there will be an exchange, the sinner, for the sinless, and the sinless made the sinner, so that I would be would have would become the righteousness of God. Oh, this is good news. Maybe this is why it is called the good news. Because something happened. My shame has been taken, and he's given me the garment of praise instead of shame. When heaven sees you and I. God doesn't want to see, the, see us running away from him. God wants to see us accepting who we are, who we are in him. God wants us to be like Paul. Who would say, Paul, a man who was a murderer, a man who in, the, in our modern day language we would say he was a terrorist because he terrorized Christians. And yet, when he came to Christ, oh, God forgave him, transformed him so much so that Paul, in confidence, could in Philippians chapter 3 from verse 12 to 13 say, not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting the shame that Satan used to characterize and define me, forgetting my past failure, forgetting my rejection, and accepting that there's a plan for me, forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ. Oh, brethren, we have a God who loves us. And, and he has such, such a desire for us to see as he sees us, to see ourselves in Christ Jesus, to see ourselves not not, not in our failures, not in our sins, not in the offenses we have committed, horrible as they are. And yes, there are things that should have divided us with God, separated us from God. Yet God has chosen to show mercy. We shouldn't be bearers of shame, but bearers of the righteousness of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, See what it says. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Hallelujah. The Bible says, the, the name, the tag that the enemy has placed on you by virtue of the shame of your sin and my sin, that is not who you really are. That is, yes, that is who you were in sin. But who we are now is we are the children of God. Who we are now is we are joint heirs with Christ. Who we are now, we are the people of God's delight. Who we are now, we are God's workmanship that have been designed, if, if, 
designed, recreated in Christ Jesus. Who we are now is the mystery of God to this world. That yes, look at me walking on the street. I may be disabled and walking in a manner that would evoke laughter, but I tell you, who heaven sees me is the child of God, fearfully and wonderfully made, the possessor of heaven, the joy of the Lord on earth. And God sees us as extension of his hands. He sees us as extensions of his mouth. So the world hears God and hears Christ through our lips. The world is touched by the touch of God through us. You and I are channels through which God passes through to touch the world. That is who we are. That is who I am. Not the sinner of the past. So when Satan brings a reminder of our past failure and shame, what should we do? Remind him of who we are in Christ Jesus. Remind him of the finished work of God. Remind him that the debt has been paid and we have been set free and have been released even to represent God. That is who you are. And God's desire, therefore, is that we live without shame because we were not created to live in shame. Child of God, open your heart to the liberty that has come to you and I in Christ Jesus. For the Bible says, if the Son of God shall set you free, you are indeed free. And this is the assembly of those who will live in victorious freedom. Because he who lives and walks and expresses himself in and through us has defeated the world and given us victory. Don't allow Satan to keep you in shame because you've been released. Arise and go forth in the liberty of God and just enjoy God's true freedom and represent him. Shall we pray together? Amen. What a joy and privilege, Lord, it is that you, through your spirit, will draw us to yourself. And give us this victory. And give us true life. And change our identity. And remove our shame. So Lord I ask and pray. That as many as have been harassed by Satan. In reminders in various ways. About the shame of the past. Lord I ask. That in the power of your spirit, because you have paid the price, that you will come to us and remind us of the victory you've given us. Remind us of the joy that is ours because of the hope you have placed for us. Help us to go out of this place celebrating that victory and bringing glory to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.